This is uh, on currencies, cooperatives, and social enterprise. Uh, primarily, I'm going to talk about currencies because that's my special area. Um, and today, I am a pinch hitter for my good friend Edgar Campers here. Uh, Edgar is the uh, executive director and co-founder of COIN, an Amsterdam-based uh, agency for community currencies, uh, which provides expertise and technology to currency programs like the Bristol Pound, the Brixton Pound, uh, the recently launched um, CCIA pilot project, uh, Tradecoin, as well as Demaki, which is a social currency that runs in Amsterdam. They also have that similar program running on the national level in the Netherlands that they call the Helpen. Um, so who am I? Why am I here? Um, I went to the University of Alabama, roll tide. Anybody else? Alabamians? Anybody else from the South? <laughs> All right, I got a couple hands from the South. <laughs> All right. Uh, then I went to this excellent hippy-dippy college in uh, the southeast corner of uh, Iowa, called the Maharishi University of Management. Uh, anybody heard of uh, Russell Brand? Anybody heard of Jerry Seinfeld? Yeah. Anybody heard of Oprah? Yeah. Cool. They're all into this hippy-dippy meditation thing called Transcendental Meditation, and that's where it's based, is in Fairfield, Iowa. It's like TM headquarters of the world, right? So uh, I actually learned the TM practice as a part of my curriculum there. I got to go to India for five weeks. It was fabulous. Yep. Uh, so in Iowa, uh, I had kind of an, uh, a mandate to learn how to create a local currency. Uh, I had just, you know, this is 2009, 2008, it just happened. I'm like, okay, wow, we got some serious problems, to say the least. And I want myself and my community to have a better chance of survival. I saw kind of a doom clock in the sky. I was like, all right, somebody needs to do something about this. So I need to learn how to create a, a defense mechanism against you know, our macroeconomic problems. So I uh, looked at a you know, number of different models, and we ended up recreating the wheel that's known as a social currency, uh, very similar to the SPICE model that we've talked a lot about here today, where we uh, created these merit vouchers and gave them to people doing uh, sustainability-related volunteerism in the community and, uh, and piloted that a couple of times. And then we wanted to create a business model around that. <coughs> Thus, uh, my local cooperative was born. Uh, that program was featured in the documentary, Money Into Life, and that just kind of helped uh, me get a little more exposure. And um, I, I was invited to go to the second international conference on community currency systems over in The Hague last June. And uh, that was really fantastic. Linked up with COIN, and now I am their fellow in the US. They have uh, about 12 different fellows around the world. Um, and then you, you'll also see this Ithacash thing down here. Uh, I now live in Ithaca, New York, which is home to the uh, famous local currency model, the Ithaca Hours. Um, they went up and did a really great job and got a lot of press, and then they came down and didn't do so much press. So I'm bringing out a <laughs> new model for the area that I think in the advance the thinking a little bit. Oh, and once upon a time I did a TEDx talk. You can YouTube it. By a uh, show of hands, who here's in a time bank? Everybody. Anybody not in a time bank? Shame on you. What are you doing here? Get out. <laughs> Exits that one. <laughs> all right, all right, no, yeah, you gotta stay, that's worse. All right, so, so who here has used a community currency? As you, as you presently understand them. Okay, cool, that's a decent amount. Who here have not used a currency, a community currency, okay? Now leave your hand up if you have used frequent flyer miles. Well, for magazines, but never to fly. Uh, so, uh, proof that frequent flyer miles are a currency and that you can use them for more than just a seat on an airliner, right? Our co-op so, sells, <laughs> sells us gift card money for 97 cents. Right. 97 cents, yeah. Right, right. That's a, that's a loyalty currency. Yeah. Same deal. Uh, so how many co-op members do we have in the room? Cool. All right. And then how many people have done business with a social enterprise? Some business that you know is doing social good. Marvelous. Everybody, you have fantastic taste. Great crowd. <laughs> so we got some good news. <laughs> I want you to take a second. I want to get you to look to your left. Look at one another. Okay. Now, now look the other direction. Not you guys. All right. All right. Great. You see all those happy, hidden people? Good. Those are the people you've been waiting for. You can quit. You can quit waiting. All right. We're here. Great. 
Very, no more waiting. We've got work to do. <laughs> we're, we're, we're to the not so good news portion. Sorry about that. Um, what we're looking at here, look, this, I'll, I'll give you the reference for this. This is off a of Forbes article that was uh, put out recently. And it's called 23 charts that prove that we're headed towards another devastating stock collapse. Again, sorry about that. Um, and, and so if you want to go look it up, you can. And I promise I'm not going to give you any more charts. There's like one, two more, that's it. Right? <laughs> what we're looking at here is stock buybacks. All right? This is 2007, 2008. That's the last collapse, right? And what we're looking at is Wall Street here inflating the values of their own assets. Right. Because I, I don't own any stocks. I don't know about you guys. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have enough money to invest in stocks. But you know, look, look at this. We're looking at the, the dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. We're looking at 2007 to 2008. And look where we are today. Wow. It's a, it's a, it's a bad scene. <laughs> The next one shows the same sort of pattern, all right? And what we're looking at here is debt in red to the S&P 500. And you can see that these peaks are slowly getting higher in the valleys, slowly getting lower. And again, look where we are today. Well, look at the ratio between the reality and the debt there. Right, all right. So we can't keep looking at Wall Street to tell us how well things are going on Main Street. The numbers that come out of Wall Street have nothing to do with what's happening on Main Street. Mm -hmm. The sooner we make that connection, the sooner we get our own numbers about what's happening on Main Street, the more clearly we're going to be able to get real about where we are and how people are doing. And here's a dumb moment. Guess which emotion is running the stock market? Extreme, Extreme greed. <laughs> I don't need to say anything. I like the okay? time scale. Too. <laughs> so this is, this is a, a, a big thing that, that keeps me up in the night. Okay? This is a, 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 just a quick clipping of an article. Ellen Brown puts this out recently. When it says shadow banking system, she defines that within the article as all of the, the financial activity that happens outside the scope of even what our regulators look like or look at and measure. Um, and, you know, I mean, anybody who's looked into derivative speculation can tell you that the figures that come out of that stuff are in the tens and hundreds of trillions in terms of how much has been leveraged. Nobody knows really how much of that is covered in terms of counterparty obligations and so forth. It's absurd. It's so disconnected from reality. It would be better if we just wrote it off, cut it off, quit feeding the beast. It'd be right? better, yeah. That's, that's, that's just a personal concern of mine, right? This thing's a ticking time bomb, and it's getting ready to go. That's why we're here. That's why we've, we've been in this conversation. You know, I'm, I'm really honored to be standing up here today uh, because we have so many legends in the room, uh, people who've been in this conversation for decades. Now, I've really been blazing the trails and uh, taking the footsteps uh, that young folks here in the room can, can follow in and, uh, and build on. Um, so this very rudimentary timeline, I know this is very inaccurate, okay? I know these things are not placed, you know, very specifically. Uh, there is a cool timeline project, though, that is building those specific dates um, in the Community Currency or Complementary Currency Resource Center. That's right, Stephen DeMillionaire's uh, project there. So you can see that we've got Let's, the first Let's software came out in 1982, and then we have Time Banking kind of coming out, um, and we know that we have Our World as well, we have a number of softwares in that space. Uh, the Berkshires model got started in 1995, four years after the Ithaca Hours model, um, which, just a point of clarification, even though it's called Ithaca Hours, place name, time language is not the time-based currency, one of my primary gripes, but <clears throat> it's cool. Uh, and then we have platforms like Community Forge here. We got Matthew Slater in the room. Where do you go? Where do you go? Matthew. Where do you go? He's out of there. All right. Well, Community Forge and uh, and Matthew Slater have been developing uh, platforms for currency software, which are like Swiss Army knives for the currency space, so that you can customize uh, your model to meet the needs of your community. I think that's an important thing. So what we're just seeing here is a gradual increase in the level of complexity and in the maturity of the understanding of how to deploy these models to social and environmental benefit. Today, we have uh, Europe really taking the lead and that you have the EU providing this funding for this thing known as CCIA, Community Currencies in Action. And part of uh, CCI's, CCIA's work is supporting these uh, local currency pilots. And you know, we have SPICE here. Um, Talk to Becky Booth about that. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. They're really, really well developed. Uh, coins, programs, trade coin, Maki, Brixton Pound, 
the Sonantes one is, uh, is forthcoming. Uh, and then we have um, a number of others that are on the way as well. And so the, the, just the quality of academic and policy level attention that's being put into this space now, primarily in Europe, is something that we can build upon on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and lest we forget, we've got this whole cryptocurrency phenomenon going on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not personally a very big cryptocurrency fan uh, in its current form. I think that the technology is very useful. I mean, here, who here, I mean, don't be embarrassed, who owns some Bitcoin? Am I the only one? <laughs> yeah, all right, we've got two other Bitcoin owners. You know, the real innovation here is this blockchain bit, where effectively what we're doing is having networks of, uh, of computers telling a story together. These computers are telling the story and each computer is making sure that it's telling the same story as all these other computers. That's what the blockchain is all about. And so the currency is just one way that that story makes itself manifest and usable. This Ethereum project is starting to build in uh, even more complex levels into that story where you can code businesses and you know, ownership into the blockchain as a distributed form where you don't you know, have to go ask permission from the state uh, to have a company. But moving on, that's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, I'm a big fan of what they're doing in Bristol. Anybody here heard about the Bristol Pounds? Have you seen that stuff around? Great, all right, good. Um, Bristol is seeing a lot of success with their transition currency. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one parity with the national currency. That means uh, 10 uh, pounds sterling gets you 10 Bristol Pounds. There for a while there was a 10% bonus, so you could give you know, 100 pounds sterling and get 110 Bristol Pounds back. Uh, a lot of models are going that direction. Um, and they're also supported not only by these beautiful notes, uh, but by text to pay, which is SMS-based transacting. In terms of uh, mobile payments and in terms of payments technology, the text-based payment space is one of the best, the absolute best. And I, I really encourage everybody who's looking into this and getting, uh, making mobile payments accessible to your users to look into the text-based payments because it doesn't require a smartphone. It, it, any kind of cell phone can access it. And you can, you know, through uh, our uh, welfare systems now, you can get cell phones even if you can't, you know, purchase it. So, very accessible. So we have thousands of these models that are going on around the world below the radar. Um, I am very interested personally in learning about as many of them as I can and looking at the kinds of uh, policy decisions that they've made in terms of the rule sets and how it works because I want to be able to cherry pick best practices, you know, um, and bring those together. And that's something that I think we're starting to see, are these hybrid models. Models that aren't just, you know, a, a time banking philosophy, that aren't just a one-to-one -one parity currency like Bristol Pounds, um, but, you know, more in the direction of SPICE, uh, in the direction of my own Hero Rewards program, and then now Ithacash. Uh, we're, depending on who you're working with, people interact with the system in a different way. Uh, so, uh, we're, again, just continuing to mature, continuing levels of, uh, of complexity, and it makes these uh, much more um, adaptable, not only to the situation on the ground, but then also uh, better equipped to deliver social and environmental benefits. So just some quick challenges that I see uh, within our community as a whole. Um, we're primarily operating on a grassroots level. Uh, you know, those, those programs that have funding that are, you know, more than three to six months worth of operations are still, uh, by and large, the, 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 what am I looking for? The exception to the rule, thank you, sorry. Um, and we need, in order to overcome that, we need to be able to make a more numbers-based case. We need to bring the best research that we have and on and the benefits that we generate, not only economically, but socially and environmentally, uh, and, and put that in front of policymakers and in front of our grant makers. Um, so in order to do that, you know, we're going to need um, people like, he's not in the room again, right? Like uh, Indradeep. Indradeep is just, you know, is leaving his university because he is no longer satisfied with teaching the same theories of economics and philosophy of economics that have led us into 
this situation that we're in, and he's been working with Rian Eisler and the, uh, the the Center for what is it, Caring, it's a Caring Economic Leadership Program, and Center for Partnership Studies. So that's it. Uh, on social wealth indicator systems, we need to zoom out from this totally myopic measure of value that is just measured in dollars and cents and start to measure things that matter, like human well-being, our connectivity, our relationship to nature. Um, so we want to get that funding, but we don't want to compromise on those values, and that's very important. And then we also have a bit of a challenge in getting these systems infrastructurally in place and then handing off the long-term management in a way and, and governance and guidance of those systems to the communities that they serve. I want to create feedback loops between our currency systems and the communities that they serve so that the communities are saying, we would really love to do co-production on housing. We want to do co-production projects on local food security. So we want to get to the global level. We want to mainstream this movement without sacrificing the, the custom level on the local level and the diversity that it brings because that diversity is what provides us the uh, economic resilience. And it also lets us test a number of different configurations and so that we can identify those best practices. Um, we also want to keep, you know, we want to start passing along those best practices, but we don't want to step on people's individual drive and passion to go and experiment and do new things. Um, what's different this time? Why do we have such a huge opportunity this time around to, to bring this out into the mainstream in ways that generations past have tried and have succeeded, but still on the margin? Why do we have such a huge opportunity this time? And I think that it's because we're, we're up against such a, a, a seismic failing of the, the old story, you know, the old narrative of the way that the world works and the way that the economy functions and who we are in relation to how we uh, act in the world and how we create value and exchange it, all of that is, is going to be up for grabs you know, in the very near future as we crash harder than we did in 2008. We have much better access to information than we have in the past. Uh, we used to be very reliant on newspapers and television to communicate information from one end of the spectrum to the other, and now we're going directly to one another through the internet. Um, we're redefining money. You know, Bitcoin has come in and really disrupted the conversation around what money is, how it behaves, how it's created, what you can do with it. And then everybody's got cell phones in their pockets. A lot of people have cell phones in their pockets. I'm not going to say everybody, but bringing the being able to ground this new understanding of money and these new value sets into money systems that go onto that magic device that I used to watch cat videos. Um, <laughs> are, it's really, it's a huge, huge opportunity. We've also got this new uh, thread in the, in the conversation, David Bollier, coming out, think, think Like a Commoner. That's a great book. And it's all about reclaiming the commons, right? The commons as all of that unseen negative space of shared value that then gets enclosed by private interest and commodified and monetized and sold back to us. <clears throat> so we're combating that by creating these strategies for co-production, by getting our communities involved on the ground and developing those commons, whether those are commons of information, whether those commons of local food that's accessible to everybody, or commons of public space where freedom of expression can take place. And all of this, to me, falls under the theme of telling the new story which, you know, as so many of you, I hope, here know, Charles Eisenstein is speaking to very strongly and very directly. Um, so that kind of begs the question, how do we tell this new story? So the ways that we tell a new story in the old sense, and just very basically, are, you know, through text, verbally, through language, through storytelling. And that is, you know, happening in, in, across a whole variety of media. But that's not what's important. You know, these are, these are totally... They're, they're very surface level. I think that it's important that we tune in to how we tell that story on a deeper kind of psycho-emotional level and spiritual level to one another. And so I see us telling the new story here I mean, in the way that we show up for one another here and the way that we feel when we connect with other people who share these beliefs and know that much more is possible than we've been taught to believe. Um, I, I see the new story being told when 
we create new kinds of entities, you know, whether those are social enterprises or cooperatives, and how that ownership is distributed, because ownership matters quite a lot, as it turns out. Um, and in the ways that we're designing these new systems of interacting, which I see in our work here. This is where we really come in and telling the new story. Um, so three examples, and I don't, I don't want to go into all of them because I want to save as much time as possible for the whole panel. Um, I think I want to talk about Kuduchiba this time. I def deferred it uh, from my TED talk. Kuduchiba is one of my favorite case examples of a, a social purpose currency. And what happened in Kuduchiba, this is in Brazil, you have a, uh, a mayor or some government official, his name was Jamie Lerner, and he realized that they, he was faced with a really tough problem. He had all this trash that was in the, the slum areas and it was like off covering the hills and muddy roads and, uh, and slum housing that was uh, preventing the trash collectors from getting in and collecting all this garbage. And so he had this huge swath of the population just living in filth. And he had a totally underutilized bus system. And he realized, wait a second, you know, these bus tokens and access into this public bus system could be used as a, a complementary currency. Right? Who knows whether he did that in that language, but hey, why don't we give people bus tokens for collecting the trash? And so that's what they did. They offered these bus tokens for people who would go and collect the trash and pre-sort them into bags. And what they found was that uh, the kids in the slum areas would, went and picked the hillsides clean as a litter, and they would turn in the bags for bus tokens, give the bus tokens to their parents, who would take the bus into the city, get employment, and that would raise the household's income. Well, it was so successful that they replicated the program in a, a number of different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, for the fishermen in the bay, they had a really polluted bay, and uh, so they would give fishermen, the, you know, if you catch the fish, the fish are yours, if you catch the trash, trade them in for bus tokens, that worked. They started doing uh, boxes of local food for keeping your kid in school, and um, all in all, Kuduchiba ended up seeing, if you, if you counted in all of the, the extra kind of benefits that they would access through these different programs, uh, higher household uh, income on average of 40% higher than the country. And yeah, he goes on to uh, much uh, great success in his political career. And um, he, they, yeah, right, the, the city ends up winning the UN's award for sustainable city design. So we're also starting to see this in B Corporation and the, the higher standards that we're holding business to. Uh, you can see people using business as a force for good. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about B Corporations. How many people know about B Corporations? Great. Great. Um, B Corporation is uh, kind of a, a, an extra, it's like a, a fair trade label that you can get slapped on you know, a coffee product or something like this. This is a label, it's an application that you make to, um, and a survey that you do annually that makes sure that you have socially responsible business practices and you have certain open accounting standards and so on and so forth. Um, and you have to maintain a minimum score in order to maintain the, uh, the accreditation. You can now also file a benefit corporation as a legal entity in a number of states across the union. Uh, New York, which is one, and I'm kind of thinking about doing that. Uh, we're also seeing this show up in the Creative Commons, how we're creating these shared resources that are out there for everyone to make use of freely, and they're protected from commodification and privatization. Um, and then also, of course, in cooperatives. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here already know, but uh, the International Year of Cooperatives was seeing such success that they extended it into 2013. <laughs> And you know, they're just like, no, we're not quitting. It's fine. <laughs> so key takeaways. I'm wrapping up here. Again, we're the ones we've been waiting for. We don't have any more excuses. We are the ones who know what different looks like. All right? There's plenty of people out in the world, as we all know, we keep trying to go get to them, who don't know what different looks like. Mm -hmm. They need us to bring different to them. They're going to be looking for that. And I, I think that lives depend on. And so we need to tell the, sto the new story as we do that. So right now, it's a matter of compiling best strategies, finding ways to get quick and easy access to those strategies, moving movements together, and getting to scale. We need to bring this out at the global level, which means being willing to come together and support one another at a new kind of level of maturity here on this side of the pond in the spirit of what's happening in Europe to get this funding. 
because it really helps when we get paid and can eat and pay rent and things. Here's my contact information. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. It would really help us out if you subscribe, share, and comment. Thank you.